Okay, we'll continue and uh, we are switching a little bit the problem domain, but I did select this on purpose because this is another application of the kind of resilience um, idea to totally different field from floods and hazards. Um, it is related to safety, but it's related to safety of the uh, hydropower system. So let me kind of explain the main motivation. Uh, in Canadian conditions, most of the hydropower utilities and the development was done after the Second World War. The dams and hydropower plants were built, and as the capacity or the demand grew up, you know, the systems were, uh, were enlarged. But more or less, they are now in, uh, 60 years old. The aging of this infrastructure is putting very high load onto the power utilities to provide the services, and they're facing kind of two um, situations. One is that the infrastructure is becoming uh, old and, and therefore needs pretty high level of maintenance, and on the other side, the demand for power and also reliability of the power supply is on the increase, and they have that pressure, uh, pressure being imposed. So in, in, in this particular case, um, uh, I developed the relationship with the BC Hydro, British Columbia, which is on the west coast. Um, and uh, they provided the support, the uh, government provided the matching funds. And the main reason why we went uh, to work with them is they have a, about 65 billion dollars in dams and power plants in basically assets. So that's a very large number, yeah? 65 billion Canadian dollars. And for the maintenance, they have over 10 years only one billion dollars. So you can see you know, how significant is the discrepancy between, you know, what they have to keep, maintain, uh, be sure that it's running safely, and what are the resources available, available to do that. So the only way to deal with that is basically to have a very good feeling about the safety of your overall system to be sure and prioritize the maintenance activities so that this budget is used in the most efficient way to uh, meet their needs. And that's where I kind of came into the picture and started talking to them about potential of using resilience as the criteria to prioritize, uh, to prioritize their, uh, their activities. <coughs> this was successfully done, they provided some funding, and we uh, proceeded in that way. So I'll tell you a little bit about hydropower safety, how we define that as a system problem. Um, <coughs> I, I, if you recall from the discussion of the resilience in the previous lectures, we were talking about simulation model that does assessment of the impacts and then the calculation of the resilience. And we'll talk about the simulation model and the resilience in this context. And I'll show you some of the preliminary results. This work is still in the finalizing stages. Uh, there is a, a PhD candidate. She works for BC Hydro, and she came back to school to do the PhD. And uh, um, we are now finalizing. She will be defending within a month or month and a half. <coughs> So the main questions uh, to be addressed in this research was development of the second generation risk analysis methodology because right now they are mostly utilizing very traditional risk analysis in order to assess the safety of the system and they realize that under these kind of situations uh, this situation, they need to have some innovative ideas in place, and they are now, we are now testing this ability to use the, use the resilience. <coughs> the activities involved development of the system uh, uh, or formulation of the dam, dam safety as a system problem, development of the simulation model to assess the impacts, 
application use of resilience as the criteria or metric for reservoir system safety and application in the real system, you know, to verify and see uh, how useful this concept, uh, this concept will be. And you will be surprised with some of the results and especially some discussions we had with them and we are still having with them. <coughs> Let me start from a little bit from the kind of general background. Uh, them, them reservoir systems are kind of traditional combination of the dam, some uh, uh, structures of the dam, and usually the power plant either attached to the dam or somewhere located downstream. So it is a you know combination of the various subsystems. You have a, a, a earth physical systems that are kind of associated with the reservoir, with the location of the dam, the type of the dam. You have a human systems or the people who are operating the infrastructure. You have a constructed uh, systems, let's say mechanical equipment, electrical equipment, and everything else that is required for this system to kind of function. And these are the kind of key components. So if you want to look at this problem as a system problem, you have to actually capture all these components and how are they, how are they interconnected. Uh, the, the, the behavior is, uh, I think, captured through the functioning of different elements of the components, the links between them, and the key uh, factor that affects the behavior are the feedbacks between different components and also delays or response of the system in time to some kind of changing conditions. The changing conditions can be natural, like change of the inflow into the reservoir or the change of the operating policy, how much water we will be releasing or how much energy we will be generating and so on. So that's, I think, what the basic kind of system modeling requires. And then, you know, this type of system you can represent as a, you know, kind of uh, uh, system that's subject to different type of inputs and different, uh, and generate different type of outputs through the transformation which is performed in this, uh, in this storage. Okay, um, the issues related to the safety of the system comes from the potential failures that can occur in every component of the system. Traditionally, uh, the dams and you know hydropower systems are designed to uh, sub and subject to very high level of safety. Uh, by using something like maximum probable flood and very extreme uh, uh, conditions that may be affecting that may be affecting the system. But when you talk to the operators, when you talk to the people in the power utilities, you realize, and if you look at the basically we did analysis of the failures of many dams around the world, um, very rarely they fail under extreme conditions. Most of the failures, over 90%, are very, very common, or how we call them, uncommon combinations of the common events. So, let's say, the rusted screw was, you know, connected to holding some piece of equipment, and because of the, uh, you know, reduced load, um, that piece of equipment, you know, lose the function because the screw, <laughs> you know, breaks out. Um, they were giving me examples of mice biting the wires inside the powerhouse. And, you know, these are not the extreme events and very hard, actually very hard to find out all the possible combinations of these kind of uh, various events, but very well within the design envelope, within the kind of design characteristics, uh, that may be the source of the failure. And that's where their focus is. They're not so much afraid of the, you know, extreme flows or very high, uh, very high flows. They're afraid that this kind of combination of the smaller and common things may lead to some kind of very large very large failure. And that's, you know, was the direction for us. In the same time, when we started working on the project, the 
Oroville Dam problem occurred. I don't know how much did you hear that Oroville Dam is the largest uh, uh, dam in California. And somewhere last year, it was um, subject to very major, very major failure of the spillway. And um, that was happening, that was happening in the period uh, uh, where in very intensive rain was hitting that part of California. And by failure of the of this main spillway, uh, the auxiliary spillway started also spilling the water, and the authorities got extremely scared that basically the failure may occur, and uh, there is a huge population downstream from the dam, and they started evacuating. I think over 300,000 people were evacuated, and then fortunately, fortunately the 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 overall overall situation didn't uh, didn't lead to major failure but the fail the spillway failed and it was interesting to look at the whole kind of set of situations in the context of what i'm talking about is how this system works so what was happening is it was raining a lot they were <coughs> the water level in the reservoir was going rapidly up they started opening the <laughs> spillway uh, to release the water. And what was happening, there was a problem somewhere in the middle of the spillway and the erosion started basically affecting, uh, affecting the spill. So they started closing the spillway, uh, trying to reduce the flow over the spillway, releasing maximum flow through the power plant. And <laughs> that didn't solve the problem. But the reservoir was very, very fast coming up because it was continually raining. And the water level reached the auxiliary. Auxiliary spillway is actually unprotected spillway, which, up, you know, when the water comes to this level, starts spilling over it. This structure was not very well done. Or basically, the, the erosion on the downstream side was really starting to threaten the possibility of the spillway failing and the overall you know, situation developing into the catastrophe. So, so they immediately reacted that opened the main spillway a little bit more. The water was still going up. And um, fortunately, the rain started kind of coming down. And with what they were able to do here, uh, the, the overall the main dam was not affected in any way. It still had enough height, um, but this structure was protected. And it was very interesting. This is the, the, the picture after the kind of failure of the system. You see the erosion from this area and the erosion from the broken spillway was spreading. And this sediment fully affected the release of the water from the hydropower plant. So, so you had, uh, now they needed to release more. By releasing more, they were affecting the release that was coming through the hydropower plant. And all these components, the auxiliary spillway, the main spillway, the hydropower plant, you see, interacted in, in a way that was leading towards, towards a disaster. So, so this was, a, in my opinion, an excellent example that illustrated that you have to look at the, <laughs> you have to look at the whole kind of picture. The, the, you know, if you look at the engineering side, I think the main mistake was made here in, in trying to close the spillway. This was already lost. That's a problem. That was a foundation problem. The huge hole opened, and all this was kind of washed out. If it's washed out, washed out, but they could have continued releasing, releasing the water. They made some um, decisions, operators made some decisions that were... Um, it was a really panic. Um, the population evacuated. They brought a lot of uh, assistance, helicopters. They were dropping the material in this area to try to stabilize the auxiliary spillway in the case if it started failing and things like that and got a lot of attention. Um, the <coughs> commission was established after the <coughs> disaster, and they generated 800 pages of the report that kind of analyzed the whole situation. And 
uh, I think the key message, the key message here is that you know situations like this are definitely calling for this kind of systems view. You have to understand how the interactions uh, may occur. This is very unusual situation where you have a kind of failure of the physical system. You have a active precipitation, high flows. <laughs> and so on, you have the <laughs> fact that there is a lot of sediment and that can affect, you know, the uh, release from the power plant and so so, so, so that, that's why I'm kind of using this slide. I was about five times on the <laughs> local TV, you know, explaining <laughs> what they were doing. So much concern was not only in US, it was in Canada on a kind of regular, on a regular basis. So that, that's the main kind of motivation and where I think you realize that the value of the system analysis is. Uh, this is the typical way how they, how they actually manage the power systems. That's the so-called risk-based approach where you have a probability of the failure under the particular demand and demand and you know this kind of traditional value of uh, uh, risk is being used in making decisions, maintenance decisions, investment decisions, and so on. And my idea is now to move from this to this, to actually look at how this kind of interconnected system will perform under different, you know, has under different disturbances, like you know the situation that they experienced in October. And this is how we started approaching problem in order to develop the model for the, um, uh, uh, for <coughs> the BC Hydro. Um, we kind of tried to define the problem of hydropower system as a combination of these key five subsystems where you have a definitely in the middle the hydraulic you know, system the reservoir with the inflows, uh, with energy being generated in the power plant, outflows, and then you have a links uh, uh, of all other subsystems with that one. Uh, we have uh, sensors that are giving us information about the water flows, water levels, pressure state of the equipment, mechanical, electrical, and so on. You have uh, humans who are involved in operating uh, the system, you know, receiving this information, making decisions, how much to release, how much to generate, uh, when to do that, and how. You have actuators, which are the instruments, mostly mechanical, uh, electrical, which are opening the gates, closing the gates, opening the um, uh, turbines, and so on. And we have a uh, tons of different potential disturbances that may come from the natural factors as well as the human-caused factors. So, so you see these five sectors are very broad and man multiple components in each of them and they're very heavily kind of inter interrelated. Um, typical hydraulic system is, you know, set of, uh, <coughs> set of structures like uh, spillway gates or, you know, open spillways, uh, dams, uh, hydropower pipe, uh, the, the, the pressure pipes that are bringing the water into the, um, the sensors may be automatic, measuring the velocities, measuring the water levels, conveying this information back. Uh, usually the power utilities are using the SCADA system, which is now basically bringing to the uh, uh, dispatching office all the, all the information about the system and then <laughs> the decisions are being made uh, uh, together with them. Operations involves uh, kind of people, uh, so the information that comes from the SCADA system is being processed by the operators. Uh, operators also know the state of the system. They look at into future predictions of you know, flow comings, and they make uh, decisions how to operate. They make also some decisions and intervene in the system if the system needs a repair, if the system needs the response, and so on. So there is a lot of elements where the kind of humans are incorporated into this complex system. Actuators, uh, said, are the kind of pieces of electrical equipment related to the kind of turbines, gates, like uh, motors that are opening the, and closing the gates and uh, uh, activating and allowing the flow through the, uh, through the power plant as well as over the, over the spillways. 
and disturbances are coming from you know all possible sources. You may have a natural like uh, you know slides, landslides. You may have a failure of the particular equipment. You may have kind of fires in the upstream watershed. You can have a debris, and you know importance of the debris or impact of the debris on the uh, on the. You may have uh, human errors being made. Uh, like we had the situations where the operators were watching the hockey game, you know, during the very important moments and missed the decisions uh, to make the decisions on time and so on. Sorry, the font is really bad. You cannot see, but so so what you know, kind of representing now the problem in this form. We uh, developed a solutions approach that involved a number of uh, number of steps, and in each of the steps, some uh, development of some very important uh, very important tools. Um, the kind of first part was dealing with um, inputs into the system. Um, we used something developed at MIT as a system theoretic process analysis, where you can kind of identify the components interactions between different components um, and you develop uh, all the operating scenarios that are going to be processed in order to kind of reach the solution. The system, <coughs> the system model is the main part of the overall model. This is the typical simulation model that will include all the uh, components. And this model is taking the inputs, you know, the states and, you know, the changing conditions, process that in order to assess and find out what are the potential, no potential, what the system performance uh, is. So development of this model is usually a relatively demanding task because you need to incorporate all these five subsystems, details of each component and the links between the components. Uh, they may be very different for different uh, power systems. They may be even different uh, for different components of power systems like BC Hydro has a very large number of dams, but some are smaller, some are bigger, some are connected, some are not connected. So you may need, you may need this type of model to be adjusted to your particular problem and your particular uh, location. The third part is now uh, um, processing and analyzing the um, system performance that's generated through the simulation model for all these input, input scenarios. So, so you see how um, this procedure is developed in a sense of uh, using all the necessary data and the knowledge of the system to come up with a possible combination of failing conditions, uh, uh, followed and feeding that into the model to see the consequences of this combination of potential uh, sources of failure and finally, uh, generating the results that need to be processed in order to kind of convey the message how sensitive or how safe is the system, uh, system performance. Um, <coughs> so one of the very significant, okay, each step is significant. Uh, in this step, we use the system theoretical process analysis to come up with the scenarios. In this step, we use so-called the system dynamic simulation to model the system, and in this step we use the resilience to analyze and show the value or to show the impact of the performance uh, um, of different, oh, impact of the performance of the system in response to different inputs. So the, the first part coming up with this possible combination of, uh, possible combination of the failure situations was extremely demanding when you go into the details of each of these five subsystems. Uh, there are tons of variables that are in this, you know, can be used to describe each of the subcomponents. And then there are tons of feedback relationships between these variables. So we needed some kind of systematic procedure to assemble all these different scenarios. And that was kind of done in a uh, form of, um, you know, supported database where, you know, the various conditions and states are being enumerated 
through this kind of enumeration of the uh, system components and states, then the various scenarios of the possible combinations were uh, generated, like uh, Earth, Dame, uh, Earth, sorry, Earth, Dam, uh, Dam, the hoist state of the particular component level and the reservoir state as a kind of, so this is one combination and then you have a dam and the sensor and the inflow and you, you, you can imagine how many, actually we ended up in millions of different combinations that are generated through that. So now you have a millions of the potential combinations of the uh, components interacting and you need to all process them all through the system simulation model to find the potential consequence of that. Uh, this was effectively, uh, I think, developed and used and uh, did show up as a robust kind of way of coming up with the scenarios. Um, we succeeded uh, in publishing this explanation of this kind of whole procedure. We communicated with the people at MIT they were using this particular procedure in uh, aerospace industry, especially the space exploration, um, because you know that the safety of these systems, obviously in the space exploration, is extremely high. And they were pretty pleased to see that even in civil engineering, <laughs> when you are talking about the systems of a totally different kind of uh, uh, level of um, uh, level of precision, you may uh, have a benefits of this procedure. So, pretty well accepted, accepted procedure. And this is how, you know, these interfaces are working, and it's just kind of elaborating different scenarios. And this is illustrating, you know, how from one subsystem with all the uh, elements or the element or vari va variables, you develop the kind of links through the system, and at the end, you arrive at a particular uh, particular scenario. So not only that the interactions between different components were established through this, but we also did establish the rules. You know what will be considered to be kind of failing or non-failing state through these combinations. So if you have a combination of the, um, I don't know, on the electricity supply, the electromotor that opens the gates, the state of the gate and the very high water level in the reservoir. So there is a rule that's related to, let's say, particular threshold level or flow uh, threshold and so on that will consider this to be in a state, uh, in a failure or non-failure, non-failure state. So, so basically elaborating and combining the information to come up with this multiple. I'm so sorry that you don't see this. Um, what this is representing now was after we were able to generate these input scenarios, uh, the development of the model, the simulation model, to process all these scenarios and find out you know, what the system uh, performance uh, or system behavior or the response of the system is. We developed the model in, um, you know, five different sectors. Each of the sectors uh, includes, you know, numerous variables. This is just a high level representation as so-called the stocks and flows in a system dynamic simulation. Behind each of these graphical components, actually, you have the mathematical relation or equation and the data that are combined. Um, I'll try to show you, if I can, some of the details. Um, let's say, I think this is the gate. That's the gate component or the gate part, which is basically describing the full, in full detail uh, what uh, is the state of the, of the gates. Uh, the gate position, the opening and closing, uh, the actuators, which are related to uh, doing that, and then, you know, the supply um, in the form of the battery, diesel, motor, and all the other variables that are affecting opening or closing the gate. There are structural and non-structural uh, kind of aspects uh, related, and all the relationship between now these variables are defining the state or help you basically assess the state of the gate. Uh, the, the gray variables are the outputs that are coming from the other components. 
other components of the system. You have uh, sensors that are providing the information. You have other components that are related to the gates. Um, you have uh, um, uh, the manuals and ways how the gates should be operated in what conditions. Um, the, you have a time that's required for the repair of different components and, 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 and so on. So you see just the one small component related to gate, how it explodes in the number of, number of relationships um, that has to be captured. Um, for example, this sector is dealing with the reservoir storage. You have obviously inflows and outflows. They are affected um, by the gate flows, reservoir levels, spill. The spill is directly related to the uh, state of the gate. Debris is taken into consideration. The outflows related to energy generation, sorry, demand, energy demand, and number of things that may be affecting, uh, affecting the outflow, some losses, infiltration, and so on. Again, we have uh, links between the, uh, between the reservoir and the uh, uh, other components um, that, may be coming, uh, that may be coming into the state or affecting the state of the reservoir, like a flow or potential earthquake or potential problem with the gates in a particular condition, uh, in a particular position, and so on. So that's now kind of describing it. This is all connected to the kind of gate and other sectors. Uh, we have, a, for example, very simple <laughs> representation of sensors, um, reading uh, of the kind of flows, water levels, pressures. Um, and in kind of doing that, we incorporated all the possible situations where the sensors may be sending the wrong information, not functioning properly, and so on. So you have a reading, recording, uh, transfer of the information, uh, condition of the sensor playing the role, and that's related to the reservoir, that's related to other components. Um, and in the, and you have an actuator sector, uh, operators, and in the middle we have the uh, we have the disturbance. So the disturbance are uh, um, kind of coming from various potential sources, from let's see availability of the gates or need to repair the power uh, uh, remaining or the time to repair um, the other ways. So we included debris, fire, earthquake, um, high flows as the kind of key potential. You have debris, earthquake, and obviously flows uh, as a key potential, uh, potential sources of hazard. They're kind of coming into the picture through this level of disturbance and then propagating through you know, the state of the system and the state of different components in order to find out how the system responds to that. Just to, to kind of illustrate, you know, behind these blocks and flows, these are called the stocks, these are called flows, you have a mathematical representation. This is the way of building the simulation model using the graphical objects. System dynamics is a very convenient for that. And each of the, each of the object is basically uh, the, the relationship, particular uh, relationship. You see how many different variables. This is, I think, only representing the hydraulic sector and details of the hydraulic sector that I did show you at the beginning, you know, <coughs> the first block. Um, those are the kind of key stocks, the uh, storage, inflow, outflow relationship, and then all the kind of components that are affecting, affecting that, and uh, even, even some rules uh, that are being incorporated into calculation of the uh, state of that. Um, so that development of the model was pretty large scale effort and um, <coughs> testing the model. Also uh, de deciding how far should we go with the representation and capturing the details of the model. You realize that you can go up to the mice biting the wires and that becomes <laughs> extremely, extremely large type of model and requires obviously the data and the relationships. So we worked very closely with the people in the BC Hydro uh, to determine what will be 
the really level of detail of the system description that will meet the needs and provide the comfort that decision on the safety can be made. So do we really need to include you know, every possible wire, every possible screw, or you know, we can focus on these kind of five sectors up to the level, let's say, that is represented here. And that was helpful, and I think that decision will always need to be made by you know, those who are operating the system, those who are kind of working, uh, working with, uh, with the system. So um, the idea was to now bring the, uh, to bring the uh, resilience into the picture, and the resilience was brought into the picture through the processing, post-processing of the simulation results. So for these million of different scenarios, different combinations of the conditions, we were able to simulate the performance of the system, find out the, you know, how the system responds, and then now, you know, what to do with the million outputs. Uh, so that was a very significant question. And we are still, in a way, in the final stages of this work, um, trying to find the best way of conveying now the information and processing this information. I came up uh, with recommending, you know, this resilience. We have a detailed simulation model. The model gives you different, you know, indices of performance. We can show them, you know, in different forms, and they can. So, the the, the problem was that we have a, you know, million scenarios just for one, you know, indice of performance, and and you will have a millions of, of curves like this. Can you put them together? Can you combine them? Or should we look and extract particular information that's essential for them? And it seems, um, it seems that the response from the power utility was to look at the particular performance measures. At the beginning, the idea ended up being you know, focusing on the flow conveyance capacity, so ability of the dam and power plant to move the water through. So that was a, if you know, anything happens to the gate, if anything happens to the uh, penstock and you know, things like that, will affect the ability to, you know, to move the water. How much is that? That's a very significant factor for them or the system, system safety. And the second one is the retention capacity or how much water you can keep in the reservoir and not to create the overtopping conditions and conditions that may be affecting the dam, uh, the dam safety. So uh, these two were actually identified by their help as the key performance measures. And then we did the kind of calculation and representation and arrived at, uh, at, at the kind of graphical presentation for these two measures of the performance. <coughs> um, uh, okay, I'll come to that point. Uh, we implemented this for the, for, as a kind of proof of the concept for the reservoir system that's called the Chikamus. Uh, reservoir system. It's in British Columbia. There are two lakes um, that are kind of connected and providing the uh, uh, water for the, for the power plant, which is located um, downstream uh, at both dams. Uh, uh, sorry, at the, this particular uh, dam that we were looking for, we have a, a concrete spillway. You have a power plant, which is downstream. You have a penstock that connects the reservoir and the power plant, and they all have their own capacity there. I think the system is about 57, 58 years old, um, functional, and still producing, uh, producing um, energy. As input, we utilize the historical inflows, um, gate and turb turbine rating curves, basically the uh, capacities, storage uh, curves, uh, reservoir storage curves, operating rules, um, disturbance parameters, uh, inflow forecasts. Um, we also didn't include the, the, the details of the transmission line, assuming that all the energy that's kind of generated can be uh, trans transmitted. And uh, um, we didn't include the <coughs> times for repair of different components. That 
was a very difficult piece of information um, to kind of find, so we made a uh, particular assumption that the component, if it's out of, out of operation, will be out of operation for the fixed uh, period of time. Uh, the depending on the type of component and available uh, 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 or the level of uh, uh, level of uh, hazard, they may be, these times can be modified. You know, they can, you can put more people, you can bring more equipment and things like that. So, so we, they didn't have that in any kind of form that you can use as a function of, let's say, something. Uh, and, and therefore we kind of went for the predetermined uh, 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 times for maintenance and repair. Uh, what we kind of simulated was earthquake hitting this particular area. The, the British Columbia is an uh, um, uh, um, area that's uh, in Canada probably the most, uh, the most sensitive and exposed to earthquake, uh, potential earthquake damage. Uh, the, we started with particular reservoir elevation and we used the inflow sequence from 1984 which is considered to be one of the periods of very high flows. So we wanted to see if the reservoir is, uh, or the system is subject to an earthquake when the flows are very high. That was the kind of idea. Uh, timing in early spring or during the freshet where the snow from the mountains is being released, uh, so melted and comes into the reservoirs and affected the infrastructure of the spillways, uh, uh, piers that can be deformed by the earthquake, gates inoperable for the fixed amount of time, again as a consequence of the earthquake, um, and the low-level outlets, which are basically outlets that release the water from the penstock into the uh, uh, power plant, also affected by the earthquake. So powerhouse permanently disabled, and you know now we wanted. So, so what we were doing by setting this kind of scenario, we were extracting or narrowing down the set of uh, uh, scenar input scenarios that are uh, that are uh, being considered. So <laughs> these are the kind of four or five scenarios. No earthquake, uh, earthquake of a particular strength, uh, no drawdown, reservoir reduced or lowered before or immediately after, preventive maintenance. So, so these are the kind of, if you recall from the previous lecture, the recovery options or, sorry, the adaptation options. These were the scenarios we simulated through the through the system. And okay, there is a lot of information in the graphs like this, but basically here we are capturing the reservoir elevation for you know various uh, for the various scenarios in different colors. These are the moments when the earthquake is kind of happening, what is happening after the earthquake, what is happening after 12 months when the gates are um, uh, uh, repaired and after 15 months where the whole system is back. You will see how the, uh, these are operating rules. The black line is actually the real um, reservoir elevation and this is the maximum elevation which is of essential value, uh, essential concern for the safety of the dam. <coughs> if you just take the release out from the previous graph again, uh, we have a picture like this. The earthquake is obviously affecting and changing uh, the release over the period of time and until the system is recovered, uh, the system goes through uh, particular uh, stages. This is the spill, a very significant situation of the spring runoff that hits the reservoir when the gates are, gates are closed and could be of very serious concern. That's the scenario four, and it's also um, in the overtopping. Uh, basically, them being being or being spilled over the over the gate over the dam. This is what the basically final result and of interest is. What you see is the flow conveyance. That's the first criteria that we wanted to represent as the. Uh, as a measure of resilience and um, what is interesting is because of the earthquake character we have a loss of performance immediately and then you know under different scenarios you have a different uh, recovery uh, for the uh, uh, scenario 
for uh, we have a very fast. For the other scenarios, we have a lower. But basically, our resilience curve is being is being represented in this triangular form. And this was a very interesting point for the discussion. So the the, the people from the BC Hydro were looking at this, and you remember my kind of origi original idea that we have interest in this loss of performance, we have in so the, the, this slope, we have interest in this minimum performance, we have interest in this recovery, and we have interest in you know the time. And they were saying, you know, we are actually not interested in this. We are not very much interested in this. We are only interested in this part. And the idea was, the idea was for, the safety, uh, for the safety of the dam, uh, we need to know what will be the immediate consequence of the particular scenario of the failure and what will, how long it will take for the system to lose the performance and you know, what, will be, what will be the level, the level of loss. So for them, this time was essential. And I was asking, how come that this is not playing the role? Because you may decide very differently to spend the money <laughs> in saving the system uh, uh, after or maybe putting some money to kind of deal with that. And they were saying that this kind of part of the graph is not so much in their hands. It's a political, environmental, and other, you know, in other kind of issues that are affecting how the system will recover. Not only how the system will recover. They said actually they may decide the system not to recover. The system. They may decide to decommission the dam. So for them, for the safety issue, is important how fast uh, is the system going to lose the performance, and what will be, you know, basically, basically the time uh, to that maximum loss of performance. Um, it's kind of interesting thinking because, I, in a way, it's it's uh, it's it's, it's uh, eliminating the overall system's view of the safety and only bringing one part of that into the decision-making process. Because in, in my opinion, this level and this slope are affecting the decisions, you know, what you are going to do uh, here. Are you going to, for example, maintain and put a lot of money into preventing situations like this, or you have a level of resilience relatively high that you can uh, uh, reserve the funds to deal with the consequences of the failure. And so they don't have that knowledge or they're not taking that knowledge into the picture. The decisions, then the big money decisions are being related only to that part of the graph. So <laughs> this is also giving you some kind of interesting insight how the uh, practitioners or may be using the resilience and 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 making uh, making value making value for their decision making process. This is the flow retention uh, uh, kind of resilience graph, and you see the shape is uh, a little bit different, and it's very much affected by that um, event, very high flow event. So. The, the earthquake event was happening here, the system was losing the power and then started recovering. Uh, um, and then, you know, the very high flow hit the system and uh, uh, reduced, the, reduced the resilience significantly. Um, so that's the, that's, you know, the kind of representation and that's where we represented and showed these four or five different scenarios and how the resilience is different and what they can do. And this is where we ended up in these discussions where they were saying we are only interested in this part of the, of the curve. Also, that brought into, into discussion the uh, issue, are the flow conveyance and the retention capacity the only two really serious impacts that uh, they, should be, uh, they, they should be worrying about? Uh, they are ready to kind of explore what other potential indicators uh, uh, could be of, uh, of essential uh, value for their decision making. 
And it is a, you, you have to understand that this kind of decision-making context is also very specific. You have, a, you have a separate group within the utility which is responsible for the dam safety. You have a separate group within the utility which is a, uh, responsible for, let's say, power generation. So, so like, you know, people in the dam safety group, their main objective is to, you know, come up with the decisions that are related to, you know, safety, whereas the group on, you know, energy generation deals with the demand and, you know, how the demand can be satisfied and so on. But, it, you know, they are operating the same system and they're kind of being concerned with the same system. And the question is, you know, when or at what moment uh, you know, who has the more power in the decision-making process. So if the situation is, I, I suppose, like a high flows coming and so on, then this, you know, them safety takes over. In a more normal conditions, you know, the power generation takes over in the decision-making process. And that's not captured by our sense. So they are both using the kind of same information um, in the in the decision uh, in the decision process, that's where you know we are kind of heading, uh, looking into different performance measures and resilience estimates. Um, very much, very much uh, uh, effort is going into this post processing of the data. Um, I forgot to tell you because we had a millions of the scenarios to run through the simulation model. We were not able to do that with the normal computation capacities. We actually use the supercomputers for that. Um, our university is connected into network of the supercomputers in Canada, and <laughs> that was that was the only way to deal with the millions of. Uh, uh, millions of scenarios. In reality, BC Hydro will not be able to do that. However, I suppose the, you know the computer power is really growing very fast, and pretty soon they may be able to actually do that. Or the, um, let's say the simulation models can be run in a different way, you know, a little bit more uh, efficiently, and so on. That's um, you know where we are. Two key papers are published out of this for now. Uh, one is, uh, okay, this one is just a review of the, of the kind of factors and components involved in the same safety. We did analyze, we analyzed the failures that are being published and available in the literature. Um, we developed the model, uh, the model for the resilience of the reservoirs, just testing that, but not for BC Hydro. But in this paper, um, I think that's a very significant. We developed this whole methodology for the, for the analysis. Um, Miss Liana King is the person who works for uh, BC Hydro and doing her PhD on that. And Mr. Hartford is actually her boss or the person who is the uh, uh, boss of the dam safety group in BC Hydro. Guys, this is it. <laughs> Any questions, comments? A lot of information and maybe a little bit more detail, but I, what I wanted you to see is, you know, very different kind of system and what's required with this type of system and how the resilience can come into, into the picture um, uh, in analyzing this. Uh, the, the, the point is that for now, they do not go into this type of simulation. They don't have a simulation model. For now, they are dealing with the probability of you know, hazardous conditions like probability of flows. Um, they look at uh, different components of the system in a very um, kind of non-analytical way. What is their state of the, uh, of, of the uh, let's say, function? And they multiply these two values and come up with the risk. So it's not telling you anything. I mean, this type of analysis is telling them very little about, you know, how the system components interact and how they may result in a what kind of uh, failure situation. So, so, you know, I was thinking that resilience can kind of bring a little bit more into it. But in order, in order to come up with resilience, you need to have that simulation model. 
and then you know the, you see the effort okay what the simulation model should be done with in generating all the combinations of this kind of failing uh, you know combination of or scenarios of input that may generate generate the failure uh, when you go with a larger system, let's say multiple reservoirs or something like that, these numbers will definitely increase because then you have uh, interactions between different storage and different power plants. And so this is just a single reservoir, single, you know, uh, it, there are two dams. Uh, one is with the spillway and one is a kind of auxiliary without the spillway here. And that dam comes only with a you know elevation into the into the picture because you don't have any operating uh, infrastructure on it, um, and and obviously that model will be becoming more complex for more complex uh, uh, situations. Okay. Thank you, guys. Um, any comments, <laughs> questions? Any one of you working with hydropower? Felipe was asking me some questions, and I don't know how much is he doing, but he was talking about one system. Which I think that was part of that course that he took in China. Um, okay, if we, you don't have questions, we are done. <laughs> yeah, thank you, guys. <laughs>